the move to the States was was kind of a downshifting because uh, you don't know people, right? Uh, and uh, the market is very saturated and you have many people who are your competitors. They are so talented. I came here two years ago and I really enjoyed this experience. And fast forward to Los Angeles, me thinking, am I happy with my life? And thinking, wow, I've been to Cabo. How far is that from Los Angeles? So they brought me in a jail. It was night and it was completely dark, pitch dark. And they told me like, oh, you can like hang out here on the floor. There was, you know, like a mat or like a, what's the word? Like a, we had it uh, at school in our, yeah, in like our, a mat. our gym. Yeah. So I just like laid down and then I woke up and I realized, oh, I'm in a immigration jail. Hello everybody, we're here uh, recording a new episode with at Casa Mo here at Pedregal. I'm happy to have like another international guest. Uh, as you know, we have already uh, Spanish uh, people from Uruguay, uh, El Salvador, and now we have a, a guest from Russia. So I'd like to introduce you, Vova Goroshnikov. How are you, bro? That was perfect. It was <laughs> you, good? You tried it. To, uh, to pronounce it a few times, uh, yeah, it was it was amazing. Uh, I'm good, I'm good. I'm here in Pedregal, sweating with you. <laughs> How do you think, what do you think about the view? What I think about the view? Uh -huh. uh, I think it's gorgeous and I, I've been here uh, many times, uh, either like filming something or just hiking. So it's gorgeous, go gorgeous. I Thank just you. want to do this. I like to do this when I have like an international guest because I know you're gonna bring like people from Russia and pe uh, your friends maybe that you is gonna be looking the video, watching the, the the show. So I don't know a lot of Russian, but I prepared this like Zdravstvet, Privet, Minya Sabut, Diego, and welcome everybody. Uh, welcome, I think is Dobra Pash. Dobra Pajalovat. Pajalovat. Yeah. Or you can say Privet Zdravstvite. There are many, Privet ma many ways to say Welcome to everybody. <laughs> so Vova, uh, you were born and raised in in Russia? Yeah, correct. Yeah. I was born in nineteen ninety. I was born in Soviet Union. <laughs> wow. Yeah and four then, years uh, you're four years older than me. I'm nineteen ninety-four. Nice. Yeah. So yeah, I was born in nineteen ninety and uh, I have a in my Russian internal passport I have um, probably Soviet Union. I, I don't remember, but it, technically it's a Soviet Union. And then years year after it was collapsed, so I became a Russian citizen. <laughs> yeah. And now uh, we're gonna talk in this podcast about. Let's gonna do like a brief for all audience that just like play to this show. We're gonna talk about uh, creatives, filmmaking. Of course, a difference and similarities in between our cultures, Russian and Mexicans. Your experience uh, flying ar around the, the globe, working in LA, in New York, uh, and now living here in Cabo. You know, the dream life here. Uh, what do you like about Cabo? There's many international people living in here. There's like a multicultural uh, place to live and to stay. So we're going to talk about all of those experiences. But at first, I want to start talking about Russia. And what would you say now that you live in here that is the similarities in culture and what is like definitely total, totally different aspects? Okay, okay, let me start. First of all, uh, we're recording this uh, on March uh, 2024. Uh, and here we have super hot weather, right? It's like at plus 20 four or like at 25 degrees and uh, I haven't checked how cold is it uh, in my hometown but probably like a minus 15 or something of course there is there is a snow 15? and I think uh, 15 minus, minus 15? 15 I think so yeah, I think okay. so I haven't checked but yeah mm -hmm. most likely uh, it, could, it could be like that uh, and I think you know climate climate affects uh, how the people um, yeah develops Mm -hmm. And I think uh, the the warm weather affected Mexicans. They are very like warm, warm immediately, right? Yeah. And we are Russian. We I think kind of stay very cold in the beginning, and then the time goes and you're like opening up. So yeah. I think w that's one of the difference that I that I see in our cultures. Because uh, sometimes you need to take time with Russian to uh, to open up to become friends. 
And with Mexican, I think you're kind of like, hey, you're just... Uh, from the beginning, From the know? beginning, yeah. very, very friendly. And um, it it's amazing, yeah. I, I, I like this thing <laughs> about Mexican. <laughs> and yeah. I wouldn't say like I don't like about uh, that about being Russian, like, oh, I will take a distance. And uh, you know what I want to say also? I moved from Russia in 2016, so it's been, it's been a while. And uh, when you live in different countries, uh, I used to live in the United States for seven years. And of course, I'm still Russian, but uh, I'm picking up different things from other cultures, right? Not only the language, and uh, I don't. I, I speak English, but I, I don't speak Span uh, Spanish. You're in the process now. I, I speak Sprunglish, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Spanish, Russian, and English. In English. Uh, five words that so far has helped you and saved your life in, in the country. Uh, Por favor, more amor, for, more amor, por favor, por favor. Mm -hmm. I saw it in Guadalajara in one of the hostel, you know. Again, yeah. it's a mix of uh, mix of the language. Okay, okay. Uh, I can buy myself uh, a coffee, right? And I can say uh, leche regular. Uh -huh. So these words are... <laughs> regular <laughs> milk. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and say something like uh, hasta luego or adios when I'm leaving the, <laughs> yeah. leaving the place. But yeah, I, I've been, I, I am just a beginner uh, of learning Spanish. But for me, Spanish sounds very cute, honestly. Uh, I used to speak German and I lost it completely because I haven't been using it for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, since like 2007 when I graduated uh, high school. Uh, and I was fluent and, you know, German is like... <laughs> sounds like a, a bit rough. Um, maybe similar to Russian in a way, but Spanish more like a melodic for me and maybe a bit... It's from the romantic uh, languages, so it's, it's similar. It's in the same family of French language, Italian, so it's the romantic languages. So, But I found similarities in Spanish and in Russian as well, in the vocals, you know, mm -hmm. in the R's. So Exactly, yeah. yeah. I, I think that's why it's easier for us... Um, than, for instance, learning learning English, right? Because yeah. I remember, I d don't know the words, I start reading something, and my friend said, I was reading Spanish, and my friend told me, oh, you sound like a, a Mexican from nor north of the country. So, oh, I don't know. Norteño. <laughs> yeah, right. northern guy. Yeah. So, I remember th one thing that you said, that from at the beginning, Russian tend to be like a little bit cold, and from the time you develop a relationship, you open it up. And I have this uh, friend at, at high school. Uh, she was the first Russian that I know in here, that I knew in here. And she was like all, all the time telling me that, you know, because we were almost eight years in two different colleges. Like we sit to each other, you know. And she was like teaching me some words. I, want teach, I was teaching her a little bit of uh, Mexican soft poppers. Because she liked that, you know, she mm -hmm. really loved me. She was like, tell me, Diego, something very dramatic. And she <laughs> was like, and then I was like, okay, so she likes the warm of the Mexican culture. Mm -hmm. Because she told me, in Russia, all the boys, they're like super cold. And in here, they she felt like super, you know, warm and embraced because, you know, as Mexicans, I even heard sometimes that there's like, people from abroad living in, in Mexico and from the first time that they say hi or they greet a lady, we kiss on the cheek. Mm. And there's some stories that they say like, I think I have a, a girlfriend in Mexico because we just greet with, with a kiss on the cheek, you know? <laughs> uh, and that's the way we are, you know? But yeah, she told me that, that people in Russia, they tend to be a, a little bit cold because of the weather as well. And yeah, yeah. Well, for instance, can you imagine you see a friend and it's minus 20 degree and you should to be like fast, you know, straight to the point without like any m little uh, movements, kisses, just straight to the point and we're done. <laughs> yeah, what's the, we finished the, our the, conversation. What's the name of the city you were born? Uh, okay, it's called Chelyabinsk. So Chelyabinsk. it's two hours flight um, east from Moscow. And there are Ural Mountains. Um, it's a you know it's a very industrial city. It's uh, the the population is about one million people, and also uh, <clears throat> due to uh, amount of the different factories, it's it has uh, ecological problems, especially with air. And honestly, that's why I really wanted to leave. Uh, and that's actually what happened. Uh, I graduated my university. Uh, I had a degree in computer science. 
Mm. So and then I moved to Saint Petersburg. So uh, we call it uh, cultural capital of of Russia. So mm. and I used to live there for years. Wow. And and now that you experience the U.S. culture and the Mexican culture, have you noticed anything growing up that changes in between different cultures? Uh, the way you develop, the way you hang out with your friends, uh, maybe what's the minimum age to start drinking alcohol? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of alcohol, uh, yeah, I, I Vodka, actually, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely not as, uh, I will get back to your question in a bit, but uh, I, I'm gonna say that uh, I stopped drinking alcohol. I, I wasn't an alcoholic, honestly, <laughs> uh, as you may think, <laughs> or yeah. maybe all Russians are alcoholics and uh, play ball alike and uh, hanging out with the bears. Yeah, I am not <laughs> the type of guy and uh, that just a funny stereotype. Um, Yeah, I stopped drinking alcohol about like a six years ago. And I recently uh, met a guy, a Mexican guy, we started a conversation and we decided like, let's go uh, for a breakfast one day or something. And he told me, and yeah, we can drink tequila or vodka. And I told him, I don't drink, sorry, man. And he, sa he said, he looked at me and said, we can't be friends. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because sometimes here at 10 a.m. they're ready to have like a beer with birria, you know? Have you tried birria? What's your... Bi 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 birria? birria. What is that? It's like a hot soup of beef and you eat that on, on weekends after you go on hang hangover or something like that. Ah, yeah. I I haven't tried it, <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna know this new word. Definitely learning uh, a word in Spanish each day. Um, yeah, and uh, get back to your question. You know, um, there is a kind of a small, a small talk culture in the States uh, and um, I think I definitely picked it up from there and um, I think it's much easier for me to start a con conversation with any person than it was uh, back then in Russian and you know honestly uh, when I uh, grew up uh, grew up in, in, was growing up in Russia I was very like a shy, a shy boy and very nerdy So I was in a like a gymnasium or in lyceum afterwards, and uh, I uh, studied physics and math, and I was always wearing a tie. You know, uh, as a suit, we had a, like a uniform at our school, mm -hmm. and I was like very shy and uh, it but, it since since yeah, later since yeah the kind of a stereotypical. But then I think uh, I started developing that oh there is a world you should be open to it you um, should embrace our, our other cultures and yeah having experience of living in the states the seven years uh, taught me a lot especially in like uh, soft skills uh, communications uh, and yeah I think it's much easier when you change the countries uh, you know that you are kind of Again, in, in Mexico, I'm a foreigner and uh, I should be uh, nice right away to the persons so they can understand how I am. Not a weird guy. They always, you know, when I, when I say that I'm from Russia, uh, first of all, they couldn't recognize it because I think, you know, my accent is not strong as it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, and it became softer and people just like, oh, are you gringo? Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, and I, by the way, I don't, I don't know if gringo is a, like a, 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 a offensive word. It could be offensive for some of them. There's like a newspaper here, it's called Gringo Gazette. Mm -hmm. And all the Americans is is the paper that they used to read, you know? So it could be offensive for some people, it could not for, for some other. But the... There's like a lot of stories of the gringo uh, name, how it came out. And they said like during a war with Mexico and the United States were like fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, they would say gringo because the, the suit, the uniform, mm, the color were green. So they say like gringo. So they, they just, ah, here come the gringos. Yeah. So, yeah. And I just c c came up to the question, how long should you live in the States to... Mexican call you green girl. <laughs> so is seven years of, of the US experience enough to, <laughs> to be called green girl or not? I'm still Russo. <laughs> yeah. And what would you say? How do people welcome you in the States? And now what's the change in how 
our, our culture, how do Mexicans uh, welcome you to the country? Welcome you. Okay. So, yeah, first of all, uh, when I uh, say that I'm from Russia, people always surprised. I don't know. They're just like, oh, wow. They are really genuinely surprised and curious to, to know about yourself, to, to know about me, sorry. And in the States, uh, I think maybe it's just a culture. It's a nation when uh, it's just a mix, uh, melting pot of all the nations. And it doesn't really matter where you're from. I mean, maybe it matters. I don't know. Uh, but it's it, it's not su surprising people yeah. so and you know they're like oh okay so and what i feel here in mexico they are very curious about about you they're asking questions and uh i myself be trying to be a very uh em i don't know the word the right word empathetic right uh -huh, empathic uh, empathic uh -huh. empathic uh person and to be curious and to ask question uh like whether i'm in the states or here but <clears throat> Yeah, I wouldn't, you know, what also uh, life taught me when you travel and when you live in different cities, cultures, uh, it's important not to find uh, like what is different, different between you, but what is common. Yeah, I what think connects us. Yeah, this yeah. is this is most important, I think, because uh, you can, you know, I can be sitting here and says, oh, there is no snow. Oh, there is no like a um, music scene. Oh, there is no... I don't know, uh, the roads are bad, right? Yeah. I can say that, but I wouldn't do that. Uh, it was just an example. And I'm trying to, like, s always try to find positive, uh, always try to f something that connect us. And uh, I think that's the best way to, to look at things. And, you know, living in the U.S., uh, in the beginning, you start... Uh, comparing, right? Oh, the the way the bank in the in Russia works, it's m way much better. It's faster. The customer service is better. You can type your question in the in the chat. They're gonna be resolving it quickly. Oh, in the U.S., you should call uh, the customer service. Maybe they outsource it in India. Oh, okay, you yeah. you can talk about these differences. It's it's gonna be like endless conversation. But then, okay. You're living in the US, this is your place right now. Make friends, work here, try to uh, uh, assimilate to this culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, there's a like a kind of a inner inner core, inner self that is gonna be like stay the same. And but it's just a way of a way of you adjusting to different cultures, uh, but still uh, being yourself. And always trying to be open, you know, to sure, to, to learn. More things, more culture, uh, enjoying the food and the difference. Like as you said, we don't have like snowing here, but we have the sun, so we can go to the beach and we can have like a good time. Have you been in? in what's your best beach in here in Cabo? In Cabo, um, let me tell you. Uh, yeah, I remember. It's called. It's not here in Cabo. It's maybe like a 45 minutes drive. Uh, it's called Las Palmas. La Las Palmas. Do you know that? Yeah, I it's heard. very um, like a calm. There are not many people even on weekends, and I've seen wild horses there. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that there are the wild horses, and someone told me like, "Oh, this is a wild horses." Yeah, they <laughs> just live there. Uh, so, and it's a not a huge beach, surrounded by kind of a two rocks or like a mountains. Uh, yeah, that was nice, and the sunset is great. Uh, but you know what's funny? You kind of live pretty close to the ocean. I don't know how often do you go there. <laughs> I'm not a like a huge uh, beach goer, and I need to take advantage of it much more often. Than yeah, I, than the, I do the, now. the the water still is nice. I just go like five times a year, I think. I would like to go as much as I can, mm -hmm. but sometimes is because you have it here. You know, you're not live like in a city like Mexico City, and you're like you want to go to the beach and have this weekend vacation but we have it in here we don't go like just like a few times a year but yeah i really like uh the the water was like the warmest that i ever swam before last september we were in cabo pulmo i don't know if you heard about that of course yeah i've heard yeah it was before uh, do you ever have a 
uh, storm in here because it was like one week before the storm and the water was the warmest that I ever swam. Do you got to be here where, where I, normal? I I, exp I experienced the the, um, the the hurricane. Yeah, and how was it? <laughs> I mean, it was wild, honestly. Uh, I didn't know because the first of all they shut down the electricity, then they shut down the telephone service. Yeah, it was wild, you know. And I took my e-reader, my Kindle, and start re reading the book, mm -hmm. and. Uh, it was great experience when you became like a the, the person without any communication devices and you just have to do something but then I was get bored I like said okay it's enough of reading I need to get out and I uh, there was still windy but I, I just took uh, get out to take some pictures and just to see how the city is not prepared to the hurricane no. at all no even a little storm for one hour, it, the, the downtown is like uh, drowning, you know. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's, it's good to be here uh, uh, during a storm as well because we don't get to have like that much uh, raining during the year. And the only rain that we have is just during the storm. So we like to be at home, you know, the kids don't, don't go to school. You have your cup of coffee. Uh, everything is good until they cut the, the ener energy, you know, <laughs> but yeah, it's nice. Now let's talk about how do you transition from being like a IT mm -hmm. to, to film make, making, how was the process? What do you decide to go from IT, which is like very straightforward structure mm -hmm. to creative room, you know, where, where it's like you go outside of the box and you, it's like different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good question, honestly. And I've been thinking about that recently just reflecting um, on this and yeah as I told you at, at high school I studied physics and math and uh, the kind of pretty straightforward way is was for me to to get to the and I was honestly uh, interested in that and uh, I just decided okay uh, I understand how it works uh, the, the next step is just to go to university and get the um, computer science degree and also what happened <clears throat> I think few years before I graduated high school, uh, we got this digital camera. I still remember it was a Olympus 3.2 megapixels. Mm -hmm. That was a crazy simple camera um, without any manual settings. But I've started taking pictures, you know, just for fun. My father had a hobby uh, as a photographer, so he was taking pictures on film. There is a film camera called Zenit, the Soviet Union camera. And he was do, doing this manually, so he was developing the film, so he was printing the um, the photographs, and maybe it was in our in my DNA. You know, I just start taking these digital pictures, and uh, I became very interested. I start buying the uh, magazines called F Digital Photo. I'm not sure if it's like a, a well-known um, international brand, but back in Russia, it was very uh, popular magazine for uh, photographers and I start learning about composition I start learning about uh, different settings even though my camera has only uh, like a basic setting so out of out of uh, white balance or just like a couple of presets and nothing more just a little uh, zoom uh, lens and when I start um, my education for computer science, uh, I got a chance to buy the first uh, DSLR camera. It was Canon 30D. 30D? It, yeah, it was 30D, Canon 30D. When was that? Uh, it was, I think it was 2000, like a 12, maybe? No, okay. no, no, hold on. When I, I graduated 2007, 2000, no, 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 definitely not 12, 2007 or 2008, maybe. Okay, yeah, because yeah, I remember f first camera in 2015 was Canon 70D. So 30D, I never heard of it. So yeah. it should be like uh, years before. Right? Yeah, yeah, it was years before. So yeah, and I, I really started uh, taking pictures and at my university there was a, like a, I would call it films, uh, like a photography school. And I started taking the classes and you know, it was much, mo much more fun in a way than just uh, doing something on the computer. Of course, you always do something on the computer, but uh, it was just a kind of creative process of taking pictures and I started uh, shooting different events for the university and I was even sent to Moscow to shoot something uh, for 
for the university and it was fun and I thought like wow I can just be a photographer and you know travel to different places and I enjoy this process you always like running around the people uh, you're taking the pictures people have nice emotions when they see the pictures it's a kind of a history at the same time because I was more as a documentary photographer and uh, I was later so that's I think how it started splitting up so I, I actually graduated the university but at the same I was developing and uh, self-teaching myself in the creative in, in, in the photography yeah yeah and then uh, like long story short um, when I graduated the university I decided wow I'm not gonna go this IT way. I'm gonna do something uh, with a uh, with a camera. And right before I graduated, um, I bought the Canon 7D, and I start. Uh, it was a camera not as expensive as Canon 5D Mark II. Yeah. That starts doing the nice uh, videos, and I started uh, shooting pretty much everything. Uh, so in the first project that I've done, it was a, a rap music video. It was 2000. 11 uh, and it was a rap music video I've been showing some rock music videos as well for Russian local uh, artists so that's how it was how it's all started so I think that's one of the things that I always encourage people to do to diversify because for me as well I was very good at maths and physics actually when I was in, in junior high I was like uh, teaching the, the kids from, you know, younger kids that were about to take the, the college or the, the, un the high school like exams because they have like, I don't know if in Russia is as well like A, uh, B, C instead of 10, 9, the grades. I don't know, how, how do you have the, the grades? A? The grades, uh, we have uh, starting from 1 to 5. So 1 is one the five? worst, oh. 5 is the best. They were having like 3 or even two mm -hmm. so their parents hires me to like teach them how to pass the, the exams yeah so and a funny fuck uh fact uh i study as it as well engineer oh, nice. uh, for one year i think and before i study the the career i was working with a friend as well and i was going here in Kabul to some offices to give like maintenance to the computers and erasing cache and you know stuff so at the beginning, I thought I was going to be on the IT as well. So it's like kind of funny that you mentioned you started in IT. Yeah, but it helps, honestly. It helps. No, nowadays, it helps in, in, yeah. in every field. No matter uh, if you work as a doctor or anybody else, you always uh, have a relationship with the computer. Exactly. And now in the, at the office, it's kind of funny because some, anytime that my editors have like some uh, problem, issue with the, with the program or the software, I'm like... Just just uh, restart, reset the re restart the, the the computer, and it seems like it always solves all the issues, you know, <laughs> like it doesn't respond or whatever. And and whenever I have like some uh, issue with the system of the memory or something like that, because I was like IT before guy, I uh, I know how to uh, you know give maintenance to my computer. So it's kind of funny, but. I really like how do you go from that because it's more like a structure, as I said in the beginning. And then when you combine that, is for me an example like when you know how to write with your both hands because you practicing how to work with the two hemispheres of your brain. Mm -hmm. One is like very straightforward, a structure, and the other doesn't like to go inside of the box. So it's the creative, it's the communication, it's the languages. Exactly. So because, and you know, you you have been learning languages as well, the German that you said. So all that helps the side of your creative and communication uh, hemisphere. So it's all, it always helps to be working as it is, it is like a gym with the, your two hemispheres, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, it's great that uh, you can easily communicate to, for instance, yeah, for, for me as a filmmaker, as a cinematographer, that's, I think that's why I picked up this profession, because from one side, it's completely technical, right? It's just the camera's codex, uh, amount of data, um, numbers, and on a different side, it's completely creative. You have to transition the emotions, you have to transition the script to the picture. So it's uh, like combining two worlds. Yeah, because you need to have the structure and the foundations 
and from that that's where you go creative you know that's where you create it's not just taking the picture for taking the picture you need to go know Absolutely. composition you need to know how to like works you need to know how to work with natural light and artificial light for example i've been you know the pavilion which is in there yeah of course uh, i've been there yeah pre-example it was a conference in there i was attending the it was i think like a, a play a theater play So it was a photographer like right on the top of the seats and he was taking a general picture of the entire stadium mm -hmm. with a flash and I was like, no, mm. you need to know the foundation. You're a smart guy. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> because with the flash you can light up all those these people, the distance is not just enough for that. Yeah, know? of course, yeah, you, you definitely know, uh, need to know the how light works, absolutely. And how was your journey? Uh, When do you leave Russia? Do you leave Russia because you already have like a, an offering in the States? So how was your journey in there? No, not really. So I told you that I moved to St. Petersburg. Uh -huh. It was 2012. So and I used to work a little bit as, a, as an editor for a company. I've been editing um, commercials um, and other type of content. And then I thought, oh, I think I would love to start something on my own and I became a friend and a business partner with um, well my uh, former partner we established a production company called Dogs of Passion and we just started uh, filming music videos some commercials um, documentaries about musicians some concerts and we've been doing that for four years And then we realized, oh, we, we, we need to, to try something else. And we started looking for, for, for other opportunities. And I don't remember the exact moment how we found out. But eventually uh, there is a O1 visa for the United States. It's mm -hmm. called uh, like extraordinary ability yeah. visa or talented mm -hmm. um, skill visa. Something yeah, like that. yeah, exactly. And uh, we decided to... To try to get it and uh, we found a, a lawyer uh, she looked at our case and we had some uh, publications about our work we had nice views our music videos had nice views on YouTube we had some awards uh, in the local uh, festivals and yeah that's how we decided to do that and she approved that we have a pretty strong case Uh, we applied on it, and we, that's how we relocated to to the U.S. And beside of music videos, what else do you uh, uh, film d during uh, being in the states? Weddings, commercials. Being in the states, yeah. You know, honestly, the the move to the states was was kind of a downshifting, because uh, you don't know people, right? Uh, and uh, the market is very saturated, and you have many people who are your competitors they are so talented for instance in russia you, you have 10 people uh around you who do the same work but when you move to new york city uh, it's like thousand people that are on the same level of, as you and maybe much higher and it was downshifting and i and i've started shooting events uh weddings uh, small commercials so pretty much everything i've shot sh uh, three short films I'm not satisfied with the first one because it was just uh, like a f someone uh, offered me, uh, someone hired me as a director of photography for for the short film. Uh, I really wanted to shoot it, but I didn't have experience. But I think that's that's how you start. You just have to accept the challenge yeah. and you do it. You uh, never say, I don't know how to do that. I never do done it. Yeah. It's another way to say it, you know. I don't know how to do it. They say you, instead of saying... I don't know how to do it. You sh you should say like I never done it, you know. And if you give me the opportunity, maybe this could be the first of many times that I'm gonna be, uh, you know, uh, building the experience. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not satisfied with the first one, uh, but the director was, and the next two. I mean, they're pretty decent. So I learned about the light a bit more. I knew how to light a scene. I knew how to work, uh, communicate with director, with actor properly. Because it's a bit different experience when you're shooting commercials, when you're shooting uh, documentaries. Uh, sometimes you're just by yourself, but when you're shooting a short film, it could be a team of like 20 to 30 people. Of course, it could be more, but uh, I'm not like a, that huge of a DP. 
Uh, yeah. I've been on a smaller sets and you have to communicate properly to everyone. You should know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And yeah, but pretty much pretty much everything. Um, some mu music videos, I don't remember if I told you. Yeah, some music videos as well. That sounds great, you know, because in the States, I've been recording music videos as well in the States. I have this client, which is like a musician. And, and it's like a good experience to go because they, you know, fly you there. And my first was in Vegas and two in Portland. So it's, it's nice because you get to get in experience how to, because it's another thing, how to take your equipment and produce, you know, in another country, you know, mm -hmm. because you need to take as much as you, as you can, but you don't need to take like that much because, you know, customs and stuff. And it's, it's like a good experience. And now I want to transition in Mexi Mexico. How did you arrive to Mexico? And you told me you have the exper this experience. <laughs> as soon as you arrived, you, went in, you, you were in Yale? Yeah, yeah, that was crazy. First of all, yeah, I told you about my O-1 visa. So basically, I got a chance to... Um, it's given for three years. And, I, and, I, and as I told you, I used to live there about seven years. Uh, initially, I had my tourist visa, so and uh, I got a chance to renew it the second time. I moved from New York uh, to Los Angeles, and then at some point, uh, my visa was about to expire, and I thought, "Am I am I happy here? Am I happy in the States?" Honestly, you know, uh, if you just like think and ask direct questions, "Am I happy?" And I started answering myself that, honestly. I don't know. And you know, when the, the answer is like very blurry, yeah. it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign at all. Because you had a burnout, right? Yeah, yeah. You didn't That's... want to continue work and you were like trying to find like another job as a food delivery or whatever. Exactly. How was the process? Because this is something that I've been talking in the show, in the podcast, because I said, because we work in the creative, sometimes you don't know how to release, uh, you know, the, ten the tension because you're creating all, all the time and you can tend to procrastinate. How, how was that experience of burning out? Because I've been there, it's awful. And, and how do you manage to, to get out of that stage? Yeah, uh, I didn't man mention uh, the personal thing, but I, I think it's fine to say that I got through divorce and that was probably one of my main reasons why I moved, decided to move from New York City to, to Los Angeles, you know, just to change the... Uh, the picture just to change the uh, people around me and uh, I got to the point uh, I came there during the strike so there was a writer's strike and many people were just oh there is not many work right now in Los Angeles and you know when you get to the city you don't know any, any anybody I started working as a production assistant but um, it wasn't so successful and at some point I thought like wow I'm spending so much time uh, for looking for new job opportunities and I'm just really tired and, and, and as you mentioned uh, and, and as you told burned out and I thought like wow I just need to, to start something like very down to earth that's why I started working as a mover so and also delivering some food for DoorDash uh, for me it was kind of an interesting experience you know I thought I personally wouldn't do that uh, ever but then I thought like wow it's just another way of uh, serve people in a way right because when you start thinking about the job it's not like you're doing this for money you're doing this for yourself but when you start thinking okay this is my work uh, I will take this food and deliver it to this guy he's probably busy doing something and he don't have a time like to do to, to go for his lunch or there are many other like possible stories and I thought wow I'm just being helpful to other person That's and, nice, yeah. and when I changed that perspective uh, it's kind of start kind of a healing me in a way you know mm. um, uh, I took a break from creative creative work I was just doing simple down-to-earth moving things from one apartment to another deliver delivering food and then uh, that question uh, was still in my mind am I happy am I happy here in the States uh, should I renew my visa again, uh, spend more money? Uh, but And then I thought like, wow, I've been traveling to Mexico a few times, like a th four or, or even more. And I really liked the experience. Last time, uh, 
it was almost two years ago, I came to Cabo. It was just a random place on my map. I point, pointed with my finger and thought like, wow, I haven't been there yet. What this, this city is about? And I checked the flights. I used to live in New York back then. And I thought like, oh, it's just like far away. I like to, to go somewhere the, uh, to the places where I've never been. And I came here two years ago and I really enjoyed this experience. And fast forward to Los Angeles, me thinking, am I happy with my life? And thinking, wow, I've been to Cabo. How far is that from Los Angeles? And I realized uh, it's not so far. It's basically like a three days of driving and you could do it faster. I done it faster because I was driving a lot more than 10 hours a day. Mm -hmm. Okay, and this is <laughs> to the main point. Uh, there is an agreement between Russia and Mexico that you can uh, travel uh, without a visa just to get it electronically pretty quick in, in five minutes. And since I remember that experience, I've done this again. I visited the website, I filled up the form. I have this um, paper on, on, in my in hands and I'm crossing the border in, uh, the border in my car. Uh, and I crossed the American part, uh, I'm on, in Mexico, and they're asking, uh, like, what's your like, a documentation for, for, for being in Mexico? And I'm showing this paper, mm -hmm. and they're concerned, and they're not answering me uh, anything. It's, it was about, like, a midnight, oh, and right. I was just, like, waiting for them. They don't give me any feedback. It wasn't, like, an hour and a half. And I've I been there, it feels the worst. <laughs> and I, yeah, I was very tired. And I start Googling and checking the website why, what's happened to my paperwork. And then I realized I made a mistake. This paperwork only works if you fly into Mexico, but not driving. Not driving. Oh. <laughs> not driving. Yeah. yeah. And then, long story short, they detained me in a jail for... Oh, I, I'm, I'm saying that <laughs> and laughing, but it wasn't fun. It wasn't fun at all. Because they didn't speak English. They said like, you're gonna uh, come with us, you're gonna uh, leave the car here in the border. They took my phones, they took my, uh, I had two phones. Passport. They took my passports and we start driving somewhere, you know, Tijuana, like 1 a.m. <laughs> and I realized, oh, I don't know what's happening. I have no idea. And I just started like remembering, trying to remember the road, where are they driving me? So they brought me in a jail, it was night and it was completely dark, pitch dark. And they told me like, oh, you can like hang out here on the floor. There was, you know, like a mat or like a, what's the word? Like a, we had it uh, at school in our, yeah, in like our, a mat. At our gym. Yeah. So I just like laid down and then I woke up and I realized, oh, I'm in a immigration jail. And what was crazy, all the people I met there, uh, it was like more than 100 people. They were aiming to get to the US. <laughs> <laughs> and oh. I was the only one who was <laughs> in verse. And they were saying like, no, dude, he's, he's going there, not, not coming to Mexico. <laughs> yeah, and they were very surprised by this fact. And I met the group of guys from Kazakhstan. And one of those told me, hey, don't speak to this Russian. He knows something. Really? <laughs> <laughs> he was very suspicious of me. Yeah, and yeah, well, f fast forward, uh, they detained me for 48 hours i mean a bit less 36 it was one and a half days experience um yeah and they released me and i continued my way here to to, to cabo so here i am um enjoying enjoying my way in mexico i always say to my friends that whenever things get like get like that like you feel like you're in the movie because you know you came with a burnout that you don't want to continue to work in, you know, in the industry and you're just trying to figure it out what to do and there's like thing after thing after thing coming out and then you say like, I'm just going to Mexico because Mexicans are like super friendly and then you came to Mexico and then you're, you're like ended up in jail and I always tell my, my friends when something is like that is because what is uh, in front, what is forward it's like so, something great for you. So I, I always want to change like the narrative that we, the dialogue that we have in our minds. As you said, like you were having this burnout and you were saying like I'm delivering food, but 
I'm like doing something for someone who is might be like busy at work and they just want to get food and I'm doing this. It's like the dialogue that you were having it was like nice. That's why I was telling like that that's meaningful, you know, like doing that. And then I like to always try to have this positive dialogue. Like if something is happening like that and then you get in jail and you're just trying to move to another country. It's because something great is ahead, you know? And hopefully, now, hopefully. Hopefully, <laughs> yeah. And now is, you know, you get to be in, in Cabo, which is amazing. And I knew you bef because, uh, and actually it's funny because we were talking this before of, uh, starting to filming, uh, that we are in the house where we record a, a music video, which is Barbie Mansion with a real estate agent, uh, Enrique Vasquez, who is always helping us get in this kind of properties to shot. Uh, and and the and Barbie, Frida, you met her when you arrived to Cabo and she showed you the video that I Yeah, that, that was an interesting story because uh, when I arrived here, uh, I, d I decided like, oh, I need to meet people and where I can meet them, I, I can work at the coffee shops and just start random conversations and just start networking and I was at Lens and Coffee uh, that day and I see this girl came by to, to buy something and I just start casual conversation to her just hey uh, can you just tell me about yourself and and stuff and uh, we exchanged the Instagrams and I looked at the video about Barbie and I really liked it and I thought like wow I would love to to meet this filmmaker I checked mm -hmm. the description I found you uh, I texted you immediately and I think you re responded pretty quickly it was yeah. like maybe within a day or two and we were uh, having a nice talk a few days later and, and I what I really about what I really like about uh, being people being open is that kind of stories because look at us uh we've been <clears throat> we known each other about like a four months mm -hmm. and we got a chance uh you hired me sometimes i hired you i was renting equipment from you i think this is very important uh it's yeah. it's uh beneficial for both of us and uh the, the this story is great yeah and we are in this mansion i didn't know uh, up until yeah, like I, a, I always recently. like to look like the synchronicities or whatever because I don't want to get that much into that uh, subject. But yeah, uh, I always like to see like uh, what fun fun thing that we are on the on the villa and the mansion that we shot the video that get us to know each other, you know. And it's nice to collab. It's nice to collaborate with people. We were uh, recording a podcast about gentrification, and we were talking about it's nice to take advantage of those connections and mostly in Cabo because it's like super multicultural and you can take a lot of benefits from people who comes from uh, all over the place the world and and for us as well you, you you mentioned you can come here and connect and we start to work you know and it's nice how we we're being like working together and and now we are here uh doing this podcast and this is the third attempt that I'm doing in English. So Guys, you're doing a great job. <laughs> thank you so much. And I'm just looking forward to continue to do it. And I just, this podcast also is for motivate people mm -hmm. and it's for self-development. And we have like a brief before we start. And I'd like to close this uh, episode talking about faith, how to keep the hopes up and how do you manage your, your faith? Oh, it's a great question. It's, uh, I like to, I, I really like to finish on, on, on this topic. And uh, for me, faith become a very huge thing in my journey, in my journey from like traveling from Russia to the States and then from States to Mexico. And you know, uh, it's great to believe in yourself. It's great to believe in people. But what's interesting, people can fail and you can fail as well. Uh, and you know, Russia is known as a Christian country. Is uh, Orthodox, Orthodox Christianity is the majority of of uh, the population. And I was myself baptized back in Russia when I was pretty old. Honestly, it was 14 years old or so. But I've never been like a huge believer, and I've never attended the church. But when I moved to the States, I think I came uh, to the point where. I stopped believing in myself. That's a horrible thing, honestly. Yeah. When you 
when you don't believe in yourself in yourself and you know all these motivational speaker speakers they like to say like oh believe in yourself but i found myself in a situation like you're literally like laying in the bed you're being like broken and depressed or something and maybe passing through the dark night of the soul you yeah, know which and, is like and, I, and, I, and i think that was kind of a natural way because i mentioned i i don't drink alcohol because sometimes people just run away to the drugs alcohol or something else not definitely not healthy and i think i just started running a lot uh so sport was something that kind of helped me to keep up but then i thought like well it's not enough and then i found a church not far from away from my from my home and since that moment was i think 2018 i really start believing in god and that um helped me uh, on this huge 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 journey and every time uh i feel like a hopelessness i yeah i keep building these relationships with with him it's nice you know because as a creatives we have to uh be motivated by something you know and 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 we need as i mentioned as as i mentioned we need to have some foundations and a structure uh and then build and create on the top of that and for me as well uh the my creative i take it from is my gift and i take it as well from from god like is the gift that he gave me and Absolutely. it always helps you you know to have this thing that you mentioned you, you have to uh trust not only in yourself not only on the others because we tend to change people tend to change as well but we we need to have that foundation that doesn't change you know Absolutely. and and it always help you and and it's nice that we're closing this podcast with that and, and and yeah it always we need always to be motivated and we need always to know that we have like a creative gift and be responsible of what we're creating you know because for me i have this thing in my mind since last year before i'm creating a photo before i'm creating a video before i'm creating a podcast whatever uh i'm a creator you know and my creativity needs to be taken care of because i'm creating things as well in my life before creating things for content and stuff so that needs to be like taken care of as well because if not i can be like creating a bunch of stuff just for the sake of creating them Mm -hmm. you know absolutely and without having any meaning meaning so it's of like course, meaning is very important meaning is very important yeah so it's nice that you mentioned that i don't know if you want to add anything else something uh, to motivate people uh it's a good question i think i think we can wrap wrap up, wrap up here yeah yeah well boba thank you so much uh thank you so much for attending the invitation and let's keep creating bro yeah thank you thank you